Hello and welcome to The Economist Asks. I'm Anne McElvoy, Head of Economist Radio. As part of our Open Future season, we're asking, should Britain vote again on Brexit? Our guest is the former Prime Minister, who's a proponent of a second vote on whether the United Kingdom should or shouldn't leave the European Union. He was the special representative of the Quartet of International Powers, seeking a peace agreement between Israel and the Palestinians. And he runs the Institute for Global Change, advocating for the benefits of globalisation. He still finds himself drawn into heated debate on his support for the war in Iraq and its consequences. Tony Blair, welcome to The Economist Asks. Thank you. We're meeting a very exciting time in terms of British politics. Some people think too exciting. Calls for a second referendum uh, on leaving the EU are in the air. Just lay out your position on that for me. So I've said for quite some time now there should be another vote. Uh, which isn't a rerun, by the way, of the 2016 referendum. It will be a judgment on what we've learned in the last two years and how we resolve the essential dilemma at the heart of the Brexit negotiation, which is that if you want to stay close to Europe after Brexit, you're going to end up in some form of arrangement where you're abiding by Europe's rules, but you've just lost your say over them, in which case the argument will be, well, what's the point of leaving? Or alternatively, you're going to be where a lot of the hardline Brexiteers want us, which is with a clean break Brexit, where you get out of Europe, out of its single market and custom union structures, in which case you're going to do short term, at least possibly medium term, possibly long term damage to the economy, in which case the question is, what's the price? So what's the point versus what's the price leads you to, a, 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 I think, to a gridlock in Parliament which I think you can see increasingly happen, and I've been saying this now for over a year, there is not, in my view, a majority in Parliament for any one Brexit proposition. So at a certain point, there is going to be no recourse except to either have a general election, which would be a mistake for the Conservative Party, of course, to do, or to say, no, we're going to go back to the people and give them the final judgment over whether they prefer the deal that's being offered to them or they prefer to stay. Right. Let, let's go into what the desirability, if you like, of, of, of this in a moment. But on practicality, and you're a, a good and skilled process politician, mm-hmm. from where Theresa May is now, and we have this gridlock in Parliament, which doesn't look like getting uh, cleaned up. She put forward a, a deal, a so-called checkers deal, mm-hmm. has left both uh, Leave and Remain in Parliament very dissatisfied. So what would be the route to another referendum? Would it be to say, we simply can't find a solution, so we're going to put through legislation for that? And in that case, how does it fit around the fixed terms, Parliament Act and the other, the furniture, if you like, of our democracy? I mean, I think once you end up with a gridlock in Parliament so that you can't get an agreement on what the new relationship in Europe is, and Parliament can't agree, then the obvious thing is to send it back to the people and say, look, you're going to have to tell us whether in the light of what's happened in the last two years and where we are in Parliament today, you want to proceed with Brexit or you want to stay. And this is a judgment not the same as the judgment made back in June 2016, where we had no idea what the process would involve and what was the final deal that would come out of it. This will be a very simple thing, I mean, which is to say, do you want to proceed in these circumstances or not, given but that I was Parliament can't how agree? how you thought Theresa May, if she wanted to, would make that argument in Parliament. First of all, she has to get it through Parliament. I don't... I think once Parliament is paralysed, I don't see what alternatives there are. Well, there are three, actually. You crash out without a deal, which would be, I think, a disaster, and I'm sure Parliament would not allow that. Or alternatively, you have a general election. And I cannot see the circumstances in which the Conservative Party would want to have a general election around the Brexit issue. I mean, they got into enough trouble last year doing that. I don't think they'll want to repeat that mistake. And in any event, the logical thing is to say to the people, look, you, you, you gave the original mandate to do Brexit. It's proved impossible to get a Brexit that even all the Brexiteers agree on, in which case you're going to have to decide for us which way you want to proceed now. I mean, it's actually a very rational thing to do. And I know rationality is not much in vogue in today's politics, but it's a completely rational way of dealing with this issue because otherwise even the Brexit people can't agree as to what Brexit means. 
So how can you possibly say they've mandated one form of Brexit over another? But let's look at a couple of challenges to that position, even assuming that, that, that Theresa May or indeed whoever was, was Prime Minister by the time this happened uh, came into force. Uh, a referendum was promised, it was held, it was described by David Cameron as a once in a generation vote. You yourself talked in the early 2000s about putting the European question albeit it was on constitutional change, but you were thinking of going to the country and saying, can you please make up your minds how close you want to be to the EU, or you don't. Mm. Both of you flirted with the idea of a referendum. Uh, David Cameron went ahead. Did he get it very wrong? Well, it's not, I mean, look, I, I think I was the only person who actually made a speech on Europe of any significance in the 2015 election, saying why I thought a referendum was a bad idea. And that in itself tells you something. In the 2015 election, which David Cameron won and won with a majority, Europe wasn't really much of an issue. Um, but anyway, for whatever reasons, I understand the reasons, the referendum was, was held. But the referendum was held as to whether Britain should leave the European Union. The referendum that I was positioning us to, to have over the so-called Lisbon Treaty was a referendum about whether we changed the status quo in order to get closer to Europe. So if the country had voted, if we'd had that referendum, we didn't need to because France and Holland said that they didn't want this constitution anyway. But if we'd voted and we voted no to that, the status quo carries on. The problem with this referendum is you're disentangling 45 years of membership of the European Union, in which particularly economically, we have become intertwined with the continent of Europe in commercial and trading terms. And this is the first time any modern developed country has literally tried to deliberalize its trading system on this scale, given that virtually half our trade is with the European market. So it's a, it's a world away different because it's- But it's not a world away different from the referendum that took pl place two years ago in which people were asked to vote and with about 1.1 a million votes in it decided to leave. Now, what I don't hear, I hear a, a strong case of advocacy for the position of a second vote, but what, I wonder what your mind the status of that referendum is, or whether one, in the way that has been known down before in the EU, we just ask and ask again to the electorates, get it right. No, I, I don't think that's what we're doing at all in this instance. Back in June 2016, okay, we knew we were voting to leave the European Union. We didn't know what the new relationship looked like. What the, the next two years have taught us, and let's be clear, everybody now knows more about this issue than they did back in June 2016. I know more about this issue than I did in June 2016. I was prime minister for 10 years. So we now know that disentangling ourselves from the single market and the customs union is short-term painful. Brexit was sold on the basis that you get an immediate boost of money to the health service and that it would be you know, a relatively painless idea to leave the European Union. It's now whatever else is clear. And, you know, I understand the long term vision of Britain leaving Europe and going its own way. But whatever else is the case, short term, we now know, one, there's not more money for the health service, actually, there's a 40 billion pound bill for leaving. Secondly, we've gone from being the fastest growing economy in the G7 to the slowest. Third, our currency is down substantially devalued, literally since the day after the referendum. And fourth, short term, if you do a clean break Brexit, you're going to do economic damage. There's no, no one can seriously dispute that. Now, you may decide as a country... But currency devaluation is not necessarily the worst thing that has happened, is it? It because is the worst thing. Because we did need a correction to... Yes, but this was a correction not because the market decided that the market circumstances of the UK had changed in an objective sense. It, it was a devaluation because of the market's belief that as a result of Brexit, we're going to be poorer as a country in the long term. So this was a completely different, this is not like a normal market correction at all. This was a correction as a result of a political act. So the point is very simple. In the end, what we have known over these last two years and the divisions as to what Brexit, type of Brexit we want, mean that you, this is the reason you've got paralysis in Parliament. We don't know which way we want to go. So the only way of resolving it when you've started this process with a referendum is to go back to the people and let them vote. What's the question for this referendum? Well, that is a good question in itself, and it could be one of two different things. I mean, the most obvious thing, frankly, 
is that it goes back to the people with, if, if there's no agreement as to what a soft Brexit really means, and I don't think there is, I think the, 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 the obvious thing is to go back with a, a simple referendum choice, which is staying possibly within a reformed Europe, by the way, and we can come to that in a moment, or a clean break Brexit, which is what the main people advocating Brexit really want. But you could have, you could have a, a different question, which is you actually have the soft Brexit option that Theresa May is trying to, to, to put forward. You could have that as an alternative to or some form of it. I mean, but these are questions that you can get to at a later stage. But, but truly, if you're advocating for this vote, you must know what you want the vote to be on. Yeah, no, you, you do know what the vote to be on. It'll be stay versus some form of, of leave or possibly an option as to which form of leave you want. But, you know, these are things that... How are you suggesting a multiple choice when you say an option? Well, you, you, you might have three choices. You could have... You could have a simple choice between two alternatives. You might have three, but you can discuss that at a later time. And by I'm the way, I'm asking you what you think. Though. Would you favour a three, I'm, I'm, a, a multi-part answer? Because I think it, I think it depends really. If if you if you end up, I think, you know, this is obviously you, you you've got to see the circumstances that you get to. But I I I just don't believe myself. There's really any feeling in the country for what is called a soft Brexit. In other words, you stay linked to Europe, like Norway or Switzerland, in some relationship where you're still abiding by Europe's rules and you've lost your say over those rules. I, I think the country will just say, well, that's the worst of both worlds. Yeah. Well, why is it the worst of both worlds? If we look at, I mean, we've looked at various scenarios and we, the economists would find more acceptable than others. And Norway is one that we've given a pretty fair win to because we think it does satisfy the desire to be further away, outer core, as we used to call it in in sort of EU terms, but still firmly linked into the trading system and on sort of peaceable terms with the EU. What's so wrong with that? Because I think if you're talking about does that fulfil the mandate of 2016, I think it's very hard to say that really because, you know, you're, you're coming at this from a perfectly rational point of view, which is say, look, our preference is stay, but the second best to stay is stay at least in the economic structures. I understand that. The problem is the case of the Brexiteers is that the reason they want out of Europe is because of the rules that you have to and the regulations you have to apply that come from the single market and from the fact you're in a customs union with the rest of Europe and therefore don't strike your own trade deals. So it's very hard to see how you, you square a, a soft Brexit with the, the main case that these people make. And understand the reason they make it is one of the myths at the... But we don't know when people voted, those who voted for Brexit, we don't know how many were hard and many soft. I mean, that's another way that you can... I, I agree, that. and that's why I say to you, you know, you could make an argument that you have three alternatives, you know, stay, soft, or hard, but... Like eggs. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know what the stay version of that would be. <laughs> um, but, but I think it depends... I, I've got a feeling that in the end this, this, this will clarify so that if you reach paralysis, so that there's no real agreement for any form of Brexit in Parliament, then I think people will... I think the British people in the end will want to make the final say and to make it in a clear direction. And the problem with this, the soft Brexit, as I've said right from the very beginning, is that in the end, what's the point of Britain getting out of the political structures of Europe and staying in the economic structures with all the obligations, but without the seat at the table? I mean, it's a crazy thing for the country to do. And so I understand from a business point of view, you know, in the Economist newspaper and so on, I completely get it that they say, well, look, it's better than the alternative. But I think as a political decision, the British people will feel, well, this is just... What well, are we I, I think it was in fairness, we haven't ruled out a, a second vote at all, it, but it's really a question of how you go through the process. Do you look at soft Brexit first before you move to it? I mean, to put you hmm. a bit on the spot, I mean, what would your date be for this? I mean, can people who want advocates of a second referendum like yourself really go around for much longer saying, well, we'd like it sometime... We will sort out the question a bit later. Shouldn't you put your date forward and your idea forward? Well, uh, by the way, it's not us driving this agenda. I mean, this agenda is being driven by a government in more chronic disarray than any government I've literally ever seen um, in my lifetime in the Western world, I would say, in a major developed country. Um, but 
No, you can get to, you may, you, look, you may end up having to postpone Article 50. You may end up being in that position. But the point is, you know, when people say to me, well, why don't you just get on with it, mm. which is a very common thing you'll hear amongst people. What I say to them is, I'm afraid, I'm sorry, this thing's too complicated just to get on with it, because it won't be gone on with in that way. Because until you've resolved where you're going to go in the fundamental questions, and frankly, the government's not, you know, the Czechist statement was an attempt to come down on the side of staying close to Europe. I mean, we all Do know that. Do you have that. some sympathy with that? Yeah, no, of course. I, I, look, by the way, let me make one thing clear. I think Theresa May is a well-intentioned person. I think she's got the l least enviable job in Western politics today, trying to steer her way through this morass. I have complete sympathy for her at a personal level. And I know how difficult it is to be prime minister. But the trouble is, what she wants won't work. And it won't work because there is no way of squaring this circle. There is no way of staying close to Europe and being part of a frictionless border with Europe and going your own way with your own trade rules. It just, it, it's literally, and every time the government keeps saying, well, this is what we want, they describe it as a policy. It's not a policy, it's just a, a statement of incompatible objectives. And at some point, and this Czechist statement was an attempt really to pull her side into a, okay, let's stay close to Europe to minimize economic. And if damage. it was down to you, would you advocate for delaying Article 50, not leaving the EU, not, or, if, not yet, moving that right. leaving date in order to open up the space if, for second? If I, was, if I was um, Prime Minister at the moment, what I would do is say the following. We've had two years trying to reach an agreement. It's now absolutely clear that the choice we face if we're going to do Brexit is between a soft Brexit keeps us close to Europe, but unfortunately means that we have to abide by Europe's rules and therefore lose our say. Or alternatively, we can do a clean break, but you've got to be very clear. Here are the economic consequences of doing that. And I would say in these circumstances, because both of those things are un unpalatable for different reasons, I think it's sensible we negotiate with Europe a different option, which is Britain staying in a Europe that also has to reform, has to reform around issues to do with immigration and freedom of movement. Precisely what was not happening and precisely what the drift of the European Union was not in well, the last few years. Well, this is, I think, what the European Union is going to have to do. It knows itself now. It's got to, Look, the European Union has got exactly the same problem that Britain had in relation to Brexit, which is around immigration. So the freedom of movement commitment, which Angela Merkel and others, but particularly I think Angela Merkel sort of sticks on. She says it's fundamental. She says it's one reason she couldn't give uh, more leeway to David Cameron to, to come up with a more bespoke deal on that in the run-up to the referendum. You think that itself is in danger as a European? No, I don't idea. think the principle of freedom of movement is in danger because the principle is perfectly sensible. And by the way, most British people would support the principle. It's a question of how it's implemented. And for example, President Macron of France is already suggesting that there should be provisions in Europe that prevent you know, the import of cheap labor in order to undercut wages in the more wealthy countries of the European Union. You know, by the way, countries like Belgium insist that once you come to Belgium, if you're another, from another European country, you come to Belgium, you haven't found a job within two months, they put you back again. I mean, there are whole sorts of ways we could deal with this. And the principal immigration problem, by the way, in Britain and elsewhere, is not really from Europe, it's from outside Europe. So I think there are two big questions that I think will dominate Europe at the moment. One is immigration, which is exactly referable to the type of feeling that gave rise to Brexit. And the second is the other unresolved question in Europe, which is how do you make sense of a Europe in which the Eurozone and the countries in the single currency are bound to integrate at a different rate in a different way from the countries outside. So there's lots of different issues that, in a sense, should, according to any sensible view of Europe, given what's been happening, for example, in the Italian election, should result in Europe reforming at the same time as Britain reconsidering. And that would be, frankly, the perfect way out of this. Last point on referendum. <clears throat> Do you not worry that given the division in the countries, it's not going to be possible to satisfy everyone, or even perhaps a clear majority 
on this issue that referendum two, and you are calling it a referendum now, not people's vote or any of that. Well, people's vote's the same thing, isn't it? I mean, well, a, ref- a referendum sort of says go or stay, doesn't it? A vote can simply say we don't like the deal. There is a difference. I don't think so. that's just a difference in the question. Look, there's no point in treating people like idiots. It isn't a rerun of the June 2016 referendum, but whether you call it a people's vote or a referendum or a plebiscite or whatever, it's just language. The fact is, it's, a, it's an acceptance that the confusion is such you need to have a final say given to the British what people. What would you do in the event the final say went against your position? Then it's, then it's the end of it. If the British people vote for leave, in circumstances... Again? Yeah, again, where they know they now know exactly what they're going to be getting as a result of that. We've had the, all the experience of the last couple of years. That's an end of it. I mean, I, I've made this absolutely clear. In my view, you know, once you put it alongside... Leave, leaving the European Union, the actual alternative, the new relationship, once that is a clear vote and the British people then decide, look, we've heard all the arguments, we still want to leave, that's the end of it. Then we'll and have the, to forge a new There are some people who think that the bitterness of that second <laughs> argument and vote would create, would actually lead you to more of a, even more of a populist backlash, a more proto-Trumpian backlash I know, but, you know, it's than, a, than a, we have already. I know, but it's a... It's a, it's a First of all, by the way, the country, there's no way of getting around this. The country's bitterly and deeply divided. And it is. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm a skeptic that if you go back and say, look, in the light of what we now know, here's the choice, and you, the people, make the choice, that people are going to consider it an insult to be asked. I don't think they will. Let's talk more broadly about centre politics in the the guise of our open future season, which is looking at very broadly at the the future of liberalism and and the the centre. You have stood for a certain kind of centre politics, very electorally successful, uh, yourself in in power for a long time in Britain and and others uh, in Europe, Bill Clinton in, in the US. This feels like something that has been uh, not just under attack, but has been sort of crumbling with, from within for quite some time. Is centre politics dying or reviving? Um, I don't think it's either dying or reviving. I think it's never gone away. I still think there's a majority for it. I think the Macron election, in a sense, is one indicator of that. But I think the way modern politics works, political parties can be taken over by those from without, outside the centre, and then the choice for the people. I mean, it, the choice for the British people is pretty grim if it's a Brexit-dominated Tory party versus a Corbyn-led Labour party. It's a, I mean, that is a choice of two extreme positions where I think there is a majority of British people that would not really want either of those two things if they had an alternative. Which would then be a case for electoral reform? I'm well, sorry, well, voting system reform. I don't know whether it's voting system reform, but it's, it's a question of... I mean, my preference is the Labour Party sorts itself out, but I have to say that looks unlikely. Sorts itself out as in returns to the centre ground. Yeah, because gets rid of Jeremy Corbyn as leader. Well, look, it's it's a it's not a question of getting rid of him as leader. It's much more fundamental than that. It's a question of whether the Labour Party understands that it it won power. I mean, remember we were in power as a Labour government for more than twice as long as the next Labour government ever. Uh, we were the only political party. Labour Party to win two consecutive terms, never mind three consecutive terms. This is 1997 to 2010. Yeah, and we did it from the centre. But by the way, David Cameron won from the centre in 2015. So it's not as if this is, you know, politics that has had its day. And, and, you know, one of the fascinating things when you look at the recent OECD report, the country that did best in terms of social mobility from the late 1990s to 2010 the country that did best of all the Western developed countries was Britain. And that was because you had a progressive centre-left party that was keeping the economy strong, but nonetheless making real social changes. And this politics is still the politics that I think, it's a combination of people who believe in a strong enterprise sector, believe deeply in social justice, are socially liberal, that is a constituency today that probably is a new you know, electoral constituency. And frankly, at the moment, it's pretty much unrepresented. 
Do you think Jeremy Corbyn could win the next election? Has your view changed on the probability of that? I think it's... Well, look, first of all, you can't say anything. It's not possible in politics today. And certainly I didn't... I thought Labour would, would, would get um, badly beaten at the last general election. Now, I think there were many very special factors in that election, not least Brexit. Um, the Conservative manifesto, which was a sort of disaster area, and the way they fought the campaign. Um, so I, you know, personally, I think with this government and this disarray, we should be 15, 20 points ahead. And we're not, <clears throat> but who knows? It's possible, yeah, it's possible he becomes Prime Minister. And if we look to the context we're speaking in now, just after Helsinki and, and that summit between uh, Donald Trump and uh, Vladimir Putin, do you think actual harm has been done at that summit? Opinions divide on whether this was just another Trump show as usual or whether you, know, whether you feel that real harm is done to the security architecture of the West. Well, I think, you know, President Trump has his own way of doing things for sure. Um, and I think it's, it's hard right now to see exactly what the implications of it are. But my, my reflection is more to this point, that it shows why it's so important today that Europe stays united. It's why Brexit is not just an economic disaster, it's, it's a geopolitical disaster for Britain and for Europe. And it shows, I'm afraid, that in today's world, the interests of America may lie elsewhere. And I'm not sure this is completely connected to Donald Trump, by the way. I think for the moment, for whatever reasons, America wants to look after itself and its own interests. Its big focus is its relationship with China. You know, this is the, the America-China relationship will be the pivotal geopolitical relationship of the 21st century. And I think my reflection is, is less to do with critiquing his position, because there are plenty of people who can do that as well as I can. It's really to do with how Europe reacts. And, you know, right at this moment, if Europe wants to stay powerful, it's going to have to stay united and strong economically and politically. And this is the tragedy of what is happening in Europe at the moment. You're known for your international network. How connected are you to the Trump team? I think you met some of his advisors. Yeah, no, I, 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 you know, particularly on the Middle East, where I remain very active on the Israeli-Palestinian question, I remain in contact with them. And, you know, I'm also, because of the work... My with Jared Kushner, specifically, yeah, is that uh, And with, with other people in the team there. And, you know, I, because I'm, my institute is very active in Africa, we, we've got teams in 14 different countries today, um, you know, I'm active with different parts of the American system and I keep closely in contact with it. Um, you know, I haven't met President Trump himself, but um, yeah, no, of course, I, I stay connected. And you would meet President Trump if the occasion arose? Well, if I had the right thing to discuss um, and he wanted to, it would depend what the issue was. But uh, Jared Kushner, his designate to deal with the Middle East is himself in the, in the firing line over the Mueller investigation, isn't he, into yeah, the right. backwash of the allegations of Russian interference in the election and sort of stringing pulling through the Trump businesses. Yeah, but, you know, for me, the important thing is if I'm working on the Israeli-Palestinian issue and this, these are the people who are designated as dealing with it, it's important you keep in contact with them. And what difference do you think that the, Donald Trump being in the White House and a shift on the way to handle the Middle East has made to the chances, you know, for good or otherwise, of, of achieving anything in the Middle East in terms of a deal? So I think that, that I mean, you know, it's... it's, it's um, as I always say to people, it's hard sometimes to have a rational conversation about Trump's policies because there's so much focus on, on the personality and the character. I think the one thing the administration has correctly understood is that the future to res of, of, of resolution for the Palestinian issue lies in the Israeli-Arab relationship and not simply in the Israeli-Palestinian relationship. I think that they've understood correctly um, and They've got immensely strong ties with both the Israeli leadership and the Arab leadership. Um, 
However, I don't think you will get a resolution of the Palestinian question unless you build it from the bottom up as much as trying to negotiate it from the top down. I think the problems um, are deep politically and economically between Israel and the Palestinian territories, and you know, I could bore you endlessly on that, but I don't think we will, we will get a resolution unless we do it through the Israeli-Arab um, relationship. And by the way, I think this has to start and start urgently with what is happening in Gaza, which is uh, a catastrophe and extremely dangerous and needs to be handled with urgency. You think we're looking towards a post-Netanyahu era now? And do, do you see anyone in, on the Israeli side that you think might be able to take on that process? Um, I think it's far too early to say that. And, you know, Israeli politics is, is a study all in itself. Um, but, um, no, he, um, you know, Bibi Netanyahu is there and, uh, you know, that, that's the Prime Minister that, that uh, you know, he's been there now for a considerable period of time. There's huge experience, obviously. And... I don't think there's an election in the offing, so. We're sitting here in a different office. I think the one I visited you in last time we spoke to you for The Economist asks, you've consolidated a lot of what you do now uh, into this Institute for, for, for Global Change. You have uh, closed pretty much all of, of your sort of consultancy work. Is that a sign that there had been a bit of Blair sprawl and that you were doing too much? Um, you know, I, I, I've tried to do something since leaving office because, you, you know, you're going to find this with prime ministers and indeed presidents who leave office when they're relatively young and in circumstances where, frankly, people can remain healthy and active much longer. You know, I was never going to end up retiring as prime minister and just going on the speaking circuit. So I have I built a whole series of different organizations and then I, I had a business side who I think I explained to you in an interview we did a few years back, its purpose was always in order to be able to fund the, the, um, the charitable work. The, um, so I made two mistakes, really. First of all, I think having these different organisations, in retrospect, and this would be my advice to anyone else doing this, put it all in one um, institute, and we have this one not-for-profit institute now, which is a much, much better way of doing the work we do in the Middle East, in Africa, around governance, uh, counter-extremism and coexistence, and this new part we're doing, which is about renewing the center ground of politics in the West. So it's much better done as one institution. And secondly, frankly, people, you know, with the business side, you're always going to get people who misunderstand your motives or misdescribe them, and you just get into a run of trouble over it. So I think what we did was we transferred what all the substantial reserves we built up in the business side into the institute that allowed us to get these offices going and get moving and now you know we've got around about 250 people working for us in about 30 different countries. So first teasing you I could say you kind of come around to the view that we discussed then that there was a bit of a problem between the balance of mammon and good works in your life. Um, well it was it was more to do with the way it was could be presented or misrepresented but but yeah no I, I i i if i was doing it again i'd set it up as it is as, as it is now but you know no one's ever tried to build an organization as a former prime minister and the thing that people never understand is that you stop being prime minister right your infrastructure goes everything goes right? and you may have a name but you are nothing else so you've got to go and fundraise for it you've got to either make the money or raise the money you know this is as I say a large organization operates in many different countries um and it takes a lot to build, but the work we're doing here is, is really uh, fantastic. And I think in time we will, I hope we can lead to a shift of global politics or help in a shift of global politics back to support for what I call the open-minded view of the world, um, the international liberal order and the politics that says globalization is actually basically a good thing, but you need to deal with its risks in order to access its opportunities. You're 65 now, really, sort of only 65, I should say, really, because you know, this has been quite a long time since you were Prime Minister, and you, you've done a lot since, but it is a good time to, to look back. You know, what do you regret? Um, well, I always think one of the interesting things is, is you, go, you stop being Prime Minister, you go out into the world, and you learn an immense amount. So I've learned a huge amount in the last 10 years about how the world works, which you just, you know, if you're in politics, especially, I came in 1997, I'd never been a minister before. You're prime minister, okay, it's 10 years, you learn a huge amount. So there are things that I can regret in domestic policy around reform. 
I think the biggest regret post 9-11 was misunderstanding the depth of the problem of the sort of radical Islamist influences. And therefore, when we, th we thought when we changed regimes in Afghanistan and Iraq, gave the people a chance to improve their lives, then surely this would work. But there were many forces that were trying to disrupt it, as they still are today. Um, but, you know, I also look back on the things that we did that are on the more positive side, the big changes in society that we introduced in the UK, you know, the radical reductions in poverty, the improvements in schools and hospitals, the minimum wage, the Northern Ireland peace process, bringing the Olympics to the UK. I mean, there's a lot that we can be proud of, as well as obviously, I don't think anyone's in power for 10 years without there being things that people disagree with. So, Lee Blair, thank you very much for joining The Economist Asks this week. Thank you.